So that's roughly, you know, the, the amount of material I have. So I decided to do it in a different way. And, you know, basically pendulum swing back. And now I have a 30 second version of presentation. It goes like this. So if you need a very, you know, high performance, high throughput, low latency, very available service, you can use Akka sharding uh, to ensure that your uh, right side is very consistent. Then you can use uh, Akka distributed data to provide sort of a secure S implementation for read side that is very available, keeps all the data in memory, and you know responds within milliseconds. That's it. So now we're gonna get deep, you know deep, deep, dig deeper. So first we need to set up the backstage. So basically, you know. The, we cannot talk about systems without touching on the concern of like what they're doing and especially how consistent they are. So in modern uh, software engineering, there is a concept of eventual consistency, which is the you know, go-to solution for you know, low latency, high throughput systems. Unfortunately, in our case, uh, we couldn't afford that for one particular reason. So basically, all the systems that I'm gonna talk today are behind this screen. This is our uh, Red Mart's um, uh, screen that shows you available slots and allow you to reserve one. So the problem here is that we really want to keep our promises to the customer. So there are no way that we can you know, show a slot as available, try to reserve it, and then we say it's reserved, but then it turns out we're over capacity you know, our service degrades and we ask the customer to, oh, sorry, we couldn't you know, accommodate your reservation. So, which means that our downstream systems need to provide very strong consistency guarantee. Not like in, you know, strong consistency. Uh, we'll briefly talk about uh, consist different consistency models, but, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty high one. So, um, you know, I wanted to give you some leave load test demo. So I have two services primed for uh, demonstration. So this one is uh, like the, the service that is on top of everything. It orchestrates all the downstream communication between multiple services, which we'll talk later. So hopefully nothing will break. Okay. Okay, so something broke. Nothing happens, <laughs> fine. I've prepared. So these are load tests, which cannot be loaded. <laughs> okay, fine. I really prepared these ones. <laughs> Seriously. So um, this shows the uh, load test for this you know, uh, service that communicates to like six or seven other services via HTTP endpoints. So as you can imagine, and I think this one was under, yeah, th something like 30 concurrent threads per second generating load. So let's try another one. This one worked. Okay, fine. Well, okay, so let's consider the presentation effect. Um, so these are our contents. So basically what I've... You show us, show us some numbers. Yeah, some numbers. So maybe you care to explain why you did this? Uh, just to get your interest. <laughs> <laughs> you could have shown seven. Okay, fine. So. Let me explain what's here, right? So the first one that I tried to show first, and I showed you on, on the uh, spreadsheet, is capacity service, which is basically an entry point into our uh, capacity services family. It communicates to FC capacity, which uh, Alexander talked a month ago. Um, it talks to transport capacity service, which provides uh, a different uh, view into our fulfillment model. And a couple of other services that are not shown, like address restrictions, location intelligence, uh, resolving uh, postcodes to addresses, resolving addresses to zones, and so on. So practically, there are like four services on a synchronous path for on a, on a sequential path for every operation that I wanted to show. Uh, the second one 
which didn't work at all, was transport capacity service, which is BCR downstream. So what I tried to show is that even though we have very strong consistency guarantee, which basically means that we cannot afford booking more capacity than we actually have at all costs, uh, we have like 30 requests per second at capacity service, and this is just one T2 micro instance. And something like 250 here, where we have a cluster of three T2 micro instances. Sorry? Was there some remark? No? OK, fine. Um, yeah, and basically, this is our, a technology map of what we use where, how it contributes, and so on. Um, yeah, so ACA uh, capacity service built with, well, basically all the services built with ACA HTTP used as a HTTP interface. Um, capacity service uses ACA streams to, well, sort of ACA streams is a implementation of reactive, reactive streams pattern or approach or technique or whatever you call it. And uh, so all the orchestration happens within the ACA streams. Uh, you know, graph. Then FC capacity, Oleg talked about that uh, last presentation, but basically we're using ACA cluster there uh, and cluster singleton to manage like one huge, uh, well, basically I think of it as a spreadsheet that controls how, ma how much uh, peaking capacity we have in the uh, warehouse, basically, right? And we use, in transport capacity, we have ACA streams, we have cluster sharding, we have persistence, all that stuff that I'm going to talk about today. So in transport capacity, it's more like the domain model is more granular so that we can afford using cluster sharding. And I think we'll start with ACA streams first. Yes? Uh, I'll try to. No, not like this. Previous slide. Uh, yeah, sure. Back, back, back. This one. What do you mean by lock free serialized write access to the Um so lock free means there are no locks in in the in our particular code. There are some I'm not sure I'm not too sure about actual ACK implementation. There might be some locks around uh, actor mailbox, right? But well, I'm not considering them here. Serialized means um, there is a consistency model called serializable, right? So if I'm not, well, I'm not a big expert in this consistency models. To me, something that consistent is consistent, right? But consistency model serialized means that you can establish a, a, a certain sequence of all the operations coming from all the nodes in your distributed system. In this particular case, it means that all the access, including reads and writes, to one particular state that's you know encapsulated in the singleton, is 100% serialized. So you cannot get you know stale reads, you cannot get dirty reads, you cannot lose writes unless something catastrophic happens, and so on. So what is exactly transport capacity? What transport is? There? So this is fulfill uh, like logistics. We have a fleet of, of of vans to perform deliveries. And transport capacity controls how much delivers we can make every day in every you know geographical zone. Capacity service is how much you can store. Uh, sorry, what? The capacity service is about how much you can store or. Uh, so capacity service is just an orchestrator. So it just basically you know reads, sends read requests to transport NFC and a few other services, then reconciles the data. Right in 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 you know end form. So we need to have capacity in FC. We need to have capacity in transport. We need to not have this address blocked for this certain time period that you are selecting, and so on. Uh, so yeah. Can you say sure. again uh, how many servers or nodes are there in the FC capacity, and how many are in the transport? Sure. So we have two inst two uh, environments. One is staging environment. One is production. Right. So. What I've shown the results of load test is our alpha environment. There we have, well, alpha, sorry, staging. Uh, there we have, I think, three T2 micro instances for FC 
and same three to, to T2 micro instances for transport. And for capacitor, we just have one T2 micro. In production, it's bigger. Uh, I think we have two T2 small for capacity service, and uh, five T T2 small for FC, and three T2 small for transport. Okay. The fact that you're running a single term means that you're just making use. We'll of we'll touch on this. Yes, of course. So in Arca, you can just declare a serial write. Is, is that is that how you do it? So you know just. Just to recap what actors in ACA do, like very, very basic ACA functionality. An actor is an entity that receives and processes messages. And ACA's guarantee is that it, uh, at any times it processes one message without any concurrency. But so serialized messages. Serialized messages, messages, yes. Like all the messages that you send to one particular actor somehow serialized by the actor mailbox, which is handled by ACA. And then inside the actor, they run in sort of a single threaded uh, compartment. OK, does it answer your question? To some extent, OK. Um, so uh, let's move on. Um, yeah, so <sighs> returning back to my uh, question in the beginning. So. If I just talk through all of it, it would take probably two hours. So I'll just you know, uh, go through you know, uh, overview of the technologies, what the features are, how they contribute to performance, availability, latency, and so on. And then I have a few slides with code examples. I'll just bypass them. And if there are any questions that could be illustrated with those code, I'll just return to them. Okay. So ACA Streams is basically an implementation of reactive streams uh, approach technique initiative, right? So they run on top of actors, uh, work well with all kinds of actors as well as futures, um, model sort of a single way computation. There are extensions like bidirectional flows, but they're you know slightly harder than the you know core model. Um, used, as I've said, in capacity service. And also, we use streams to um, set sort of stream data into Redshift for you know, uh, analytical processing uh, from transport capacity. Sorry, yes? In the case that ACA streams still can only like, run on one box, it uh, It cannot. So I think light band, light band, right? Yeah. Uh, they are working to enable, you know, multi GVM, well, multi GVM, multi node inst streams. Before 2.5, they didn't have that capability. Well, maybe 2.7, 2.5.7 or something. Recently, they added some, some, some sort of remote source or remote sync that allows you to sort of, you know, throw the payloads over the network. We haven't used that, so I cannot provide any, any more details so far. But yeah, in general, stream runs in you know, one GVM, basically. So uh, advantages. This is a basically a concurrent execution with the same concurrency guarantees that actors provide. So no, no locking, no thread management, no that sort of thing. Um, one particular very useful feature of reactive streams in general and ACA streams by uh, implementation is that back pressure prevents overloading slow components. So your failures, if you're just really overloading, if your rate of request is really higher than what your slowest component can process, sort of failures start to happen earlier before you actually hit that component. So they happen in less busy components. And because of that, it recovers very, you know, much faster than otherwise. Uh, and um, my other partner in our uh, in our team is has a you know hardware engineering background, and he really likes that it looks like a uh, Simulink or MATLAB. So you are just basically connecting your components, you know, describing inputs and outputs, and then it, it sort of runs. So yeah, disadvantage is logging is harder. You just need to throw you know, specific logging stages all over the place. Um, complex graphs, like graphs really goes complex very, qu very quickly. 
I think I'll just need to illustrate here. So there are two APIs. One is sort of functional combinators, map, 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 flat map, filter, map async, that sort of thing. Uh, the other, so these ones are sort of, they can only build you a sort of linear stream. For more complex streams where you need branches, where you need, I don't know, loops, flow control, you have to use graphs. And this is just basically a very simple graph that you know, takes an input, sends it to two services, merges the output, this size. So the, lo the quali uh, quantity of, I don't know, sort of boilerplate code grows very rapidly. Now imagine if you have like four services that you need to communicate, and then you need to merge them in different ways. So this really gets complex very quickly. As an anecdote, I did a refactoring. So in our initial implementation used flows everywhere. Later, I've just refactored so that they're reserved to top level components. Uh, so DPR was like plus 1,000 lines minus 2,000. So need to be careful with that. But you're still using uh, this uh, graph-like description, not uh Yes, but in, in top level components. So now previously we had graph levels, you know, graph graph flows in a down like in a downstream services. I just replaced it with future based computation, put it to you know, reserved everything oh, flow related to to top level. Can you go back to sure. the name of your so yeah. So you can use functional, you can use a graph. So yes. you whenever you use streams you actually use graph API, not the uh, functional combinators. Uh, if we have linear stream, we use this. So graph APIs was only for, you know, where required. Mm -hmm. Pre we, how do I say that? We preferred functional API over graph API, but. You can do branch in uh, functional API as well. Yes. <coughs> so what was the decision like to go for a graph API over functional Um wasn't my decision, so I cannot provide you know deep deep, deep inside. But you know, uh, in some cases, some stages are not available. So, for example, merges. I don't think you can do. You can do everything. Like, is it okay, actually you, you can navigate to this like uh, symbol from Graph API and give mm -hmm. you a corresponding message that you can do the, do the same thing. Okay. Well, maybe I've lost something. Okay. Um, so a few caveats, because it's uh, reactive streams, it basically works right to left. So data transfer happens left to right, but data is only propagated if the downstream component pulls. And pulls are propagated right to left. So it's very easy to achieve, you know, to end up with a stream that doesn't run at all. Like, here's an example, this one. Uh, looks really, you know, uh, innocent. Queries merges at the end, broadcasts. So without this buffer, it doesn't even run because or else pulls on, you know, f uh, primary input first. So the or else, uh, what it does is that if you have two inputs, it first tries to obtain a result from the primary. If primary stream, primary input doesn't produce any, any value, it tries to pull from secondary. So on the other side, we have a broadcast. Broadcast emits elements only when it's pulled on the both inputs. So in this case, without the buffer, what happens is that or else block pulls on the top stream and waits. And waits and waits and waits and waits. So in order to make it run, you need to put buffer, buffer here. So buffer pulls on the broadcast. Broadcast you know, emits elements. Everything's moving. But you know, this is a sort of a caveat. It's very easy to end up with the stream that doesn't run at all. Um, yeah, modularization is sort of a coast operation. Even though there are sort of a two modes how you can utilize streams. One is create a stream, like a, a runnable stream for every, uh, I don't know, HTTP request you have. The other one is to have a long living graph that, you know, a long living stream that runs all the time. Um, so in ArcHTTP, the approach is sort of slightly favoring the first one, even though the merchantization is said to be costly. 
And last one is, uh, you know, th that's a sort of a one-way road. If you do, f if you start doing flows or streams, you cannot go back. Well, you can, but it's expensive. Okay. Next one, HTTP. So this is a very simple concept. Uh, play Scalatra if someone's still using it. Finagle, uh, Lagom, all are frameworks. They have certain, they impose certain way of creating your application. So you need to have controllers, controllers need to have services, and so on. ArcHTTP is just sort of the opposite. It's a lightweight framework that plugs into your application and allows you to, and allows it to ac accept and respond to HTTP requests. Nothing more, nothing less. Um, so it works well with, uh, it supports WebSocket and HTTPS, even though HTTPS support was added pretty recently, so we're not using them. I'm not sure how, how well it works. Um, works great with streams and actors, actually implemented by in, in, in using streams at the background. Definitions are composable, so functional uh, mongers will like it. Uh, maybe not as, as HTTP for us, but you know, comparable. Um, Opt-in caching, easily extendable, low overhead. Uh, by low overhead, I mean that we haven't observed, when we were doing low tests and performance uh, investigations, we haven't observed that ArcHTTP added more than uh, uh, like a millisecond or something compared to what business logic took. Um, business logic and maybe serialization. So this is where we use them, basically everywhere except for uh, fulfillment pipeline service, which is a very special beast, but we'll not talk about it later today. Um, so advantages, disadvantages, I believe you can read, I can talk. Uh, so adding cross-cutting concerns is really easy, I think. Yeah, not this one, this one. So all the cross-cutting concerns here are added by this directive, which is, just just a line of code. Behind the scenes, it's very complex, but uh, like the implementation of these log request result and request response metrics are somewhat sophisticated. But basically, at the route level, it's very easy to add them. Um, so this is again runs on top of Hakka streams, and because of that, it has back pressure, avoids overloading downstream systems. Everyone's happy. Uh, can be plugged directly into Akka stream. Few caveats there. For example, if Akka stream ends with a failure, you don't have, you receive a rejection, which is just a 404 with a text response, not even application JSON. Could do some, you know, handling around that, but you know, this is this is not that intuitive. Uh, caveats. We observed one thing when we updated. HTTP to a new minor version and then didn't update ACA streams and because of some implementation details we had a performance degradation like three or four times when we upgraded everything was back to normal so you know minor versions not 100% compatible and finally it's like very loudly communicated in the documentation itself. It says, client must consume entire uh, entity body because, uh, response body, because if it's not doing that, downstream uh, producing system thinks that is being back pressured and doesn't continue, all the, uh, you know, connection gets stuck. Yes? Yeah. Which so one, this one? The point of advantage is, can we plug directly into Akka stream. So can I treat a long-lived HTTP connection as a stream? Is, this, is that what it means? Does, can it act like an HTTP client as well? I think so. So basically, what like in Akka there is a directive uh, that produces you a Akka stream source as from the, from the request. So if you have a long-lived request, if you're sort of, you know, a DTO, well, I don't know how do, you, how, do you how do you name these things. So if your DTO has uh, ability f 
to, to support that streaming, this is basically autom automatically happens, right? I think so. I haven't tried. This is a very interesting question. So let me know if you try it. I'll let you know if I try it. Um, OK. So next step is ACA persistence. So this one is basically a persistence plugin for ACA. Uh, it has an opinion. An opinion is that you need to have event sourcing. So mm, that's why. OK. So um, there are multiple persistence plugins. I think only two are officially supported. Not sure what does it mean, but um, it is available for Cassandra and for Level DB. But Level DB is only for you know local testing, that sort of thing. So main feature is that it's event sourcing with all the disadvantages and advantages that it produces. Um, state remains always in memory, so that. You don't need to go to database to fetch state, update it, put it back, and only then respond. Uh, there are multiple storage plugins, and there are a few sort of plugins that allow you to change semantics of message passing between actors, which is uh, at least once delivery. So basically, it's used both in transport and FC capacity to uh, persist actor state. We use Cassandra. Um, we use, we're currently building custom CQRS site, read site, uh, just you know, purely using Cassandra directly. Um, we'll see how it goes. So, uh, to what extent are you using event sourcing? Um, so, as I've said, Aka Persistence have an opinion that you need to model your you know, application state as event sourcing system. So, essentially, since transport NFC capacity only have state in, an act in persistent actors, it's like, I would say it's 100% event sourcing. How do you find the transition? Uh, we didn't have anything to transition from, so, so we just. No. Yeah, so I've, well, I, we can talk about that later. I, have, I actually have sort of a detour slide into caveats and probably one of the you know major problems when it comes to uh, persistence but that'll probably take a long time so let's just skip it and reserve it for you know question session or at the end of the presentation um, so uh, because all the state is always in memory it's very high throughput and la low latency um, easy to implement well since, since it's eventual uh, event sourcing <laughs> easy to implement secures and you know corresponding technologies um, no state records in the DB, so you cannot just go there and look what's, what's your application state right now, right? So we need to, especially if you're using binary serialization, you cannot even tell without uh, support of you know, special tools what are the events there. So pick serialization plugin carefully. It's very hard to change because the idea is that all your events are available from the beginning of time. Um, I think we did you know, not a very good job in here because we used cryo and it's basically a binary serialization that's very specific to Java. So it's not even Pradabuff. I think Akka suggests Pradabuff uh, as a, you know, as a, as a, as a first serialization choice. Uh, we choose cryo. Um, we, we suffer a little bit. So before version 08, 85 of Cassandra persistent storage. It was not eagerly initializing all the connections. And because of that, we actually had very, you know, very sophisticated problems. So basically, when something, uh, when your actor is being restarted, it needs to read all the, you know, history of messages, right? In some cases, restarts happen well, I think we'll talk about that in, in charting, but basically, you know, there is a, a problem that initializing connection takes four to five seconds. And because of that, we're losing customer requests uh, to otherwise, you know, pretty, you know, uh, healthy system. And not so sure about this, but we just recently observed that if persistence fails, <coughs> there are no, you know, usual supervision kicked in. All right. So, cluster and sharding. 
Um, this is the slide about the uh, consistency model. So what we need to look here is, like there's a link to this entire thing with clickable map with all the deep explanations about the consistency models. What we need to look here is that sort of right branch talks about single object consistency. Left branch is more of a transactional one. So in here, um, like color coding didn't you know, fit into the slide. So red means that this system is very consistent. But in case of partition, you basically lose all of it or part of it. Orange means that if, you're, if you have sort of a sticky reads and sticky writes that always go to the same node, in case of you know, partition, your, most of your clients stay, stay up. Only those that connect to the failed mode, uh, to, to the failed node fail. Blue ones mean that there is total availability at the cost of lowest consistency which means that even under uh, network partition, node failure, all of the state is available. All the clients can proceed. OK, we'll skip this one. So singleton. Uh, this is basically a concept that allows you, a, a concept, a plug-in, a technology that allows you to run one single instance of something, of an actor, basically, in your entire setup. Uh, yeah, basically the idea is that you might want to control access to some external resource like, I don't know, rate limited API, third party API, uh, database connection, uh, something else. In that case, it might make sense to model it as a single entity in the entire cluster. Um, this has a additional benefit is that cluster singleton is automatically restarted on other nodes if your node fail. So you can use it to model sort of a very, sorry, very robust, persistent uh, entity. Right? So, yes? So, uh, can you go back to the sure. So I understand CAP. Uh, um, you don't have time. Yeah. Can you just say what ELC? Yes, so this is explained here. So there is an extension to uh, CAP theorem, which is also, you know, takes into account what happens if there are no partitioning. And basically it says, uh, in case of network partition and blah, 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 you have availability or, con or consistency, else you can choose between latency or consistency, all right? So basically that means that in, in presence of partition, you can have either availability or consistency. Without it, you can favor consistency or latency. Like Elasticsearch. To some extent, yes. Um, so in this case, uh, consistency model is linearizable. So all the requests are linear because of the uh, guarantees that ACA mail, uh, actor inbox provides. Uh, in terms of uh, pace LC, favors consistency always. Um, used in FC capacity to model actual domain objects and in transport capacity sort of indirectly because ACA cluster sharding uses singleton to, as sort of a clustering uh, sharding coordinator. Um, advantages provides very strong consistency model. Basically as close as you can get to strong consistency. Uh, might be some, you know, uh, edge effects in presence of node crashes or persistence failures. But general, if you know, if your database, if, if Cassandra is healthy, is connection to, to Cassandra healthy, uh, this is basically a serialized or uh, what uh, linearized uh, consistency model. Disadvantages, obviously, performance bottleneck, single point of failure, can scale out, uh, basically utilize a single CPU over your entire cluster. Um, single CPU? Yes. You mean uh, virtual CPU? Virtual CPU. Cannot run on two calls. Uh, if your, like, internals of the actor can be parallelized than could be. But basically the idea is that it always processes one message at a time. 
there are no concurrent access to internals. Why would you want to use a single internal? Can you give a use case? So in this particular case, sorry? No, consistency. consistency. Consistency, yes. So in this particular case, like our business requirement is to have very strong consistency guarantee. Like our sort of, if we model, like if you represent um, like underutilization of capacity and overutilization, right? So our cost function is like this. So overutilizing one unit is more expensive than under wasting like 10 or 20 units of capacity. In that case, we want to prevent, you know, overutilization happening because of the technolo you know, technological limits, and which completely rules out eventual consistency mode. We need to be, we need to guarantee that every reservation, like capacity reservation request, sees most up-to-date state of whatever it is talking about, to, talking to. You're talking about overbooking. Yes. Overbooking the slot. Yes. So this is something that we want to prevent. And because of that, uh, and because of the, you know, uh, details of upper, gory details of Red Mart's operation in the warehouse, we basically have like one giant entity representing entire capacity in in FC, in wa warehouse. And because of that, we chose to use uh, Singleton. Actually, it wasn't my choice, it was Oleg, so you should have asked him uh, a month ago. So... Potential consistency, you still can uh, have uh, like strong consistency, but you can guarantee latency for it. So basically, you can regulate your latency for it with uh, like uh, hardware resources available. Let's talk about it offline. Okay. I, I sort of could imagine what you're talking about, but not so sure I understand completely. So um, yeah, so overall, really stick to the recommendation given in the document in the ACA docs. It sh Singleton should not be your you know go-to choice for design. So. Um, this is about sharding. So the idea here is that your application state could be represented as a collection of you know, reasonably independent entities. And you want to spread those entities across the cluster to achieve higher uh, resource utilization, you know, uh, be able to run more stuff. Like one of the use cases given in the docs is that if your application state doesn't fit into memory of single machine, you might want to utilize sharding so that you shard it and utilize memory of multiple machines, right? Um, uh, so with ACA persistence, it allows sort of a durable entities to be run somewhere in the cluster and automatically being recovered in case of any problem, node failure, network partition, all that, all that stuff. Um, Consistency model is slightly lower than in singleton case because between the sequential linearizable, there is a concept of messages. Need, you need to be, to be able to establish either total order of messages with the wall clock time or total order of messages with, uh, with regard to each individual sender, something like this. So in this case, since there are multiple, <laughs> send, multiple entities multiple senders, multiple receivers, it's much harder to establish sort of wall clock total ordering. Um, Why would you want to use something like cluster sharding instead of having a distributed system? Like why not two separate processes running across machines? So would you have copies of data on both? Or just push it down to database? Depends on the requirement, but... So if you have copy, then you cannot achieve this consistency level. If you have, if you push all the all to the database, you're basically having performance issues because your scalability uh, have a bottleneck of database. So this is one way of you know overcoming this limitation. Um, in this particular case, since ACA persistence basically ever like most of the operations happening is just writing to Cassandra, like appending only writes. It doesn't take, uh, you know, it, it has much better performance characteristics. So it actually ever reads from Cassandra when it needs to recover either singleton or 
sharded entity, sharded actor. And again, it reads sequentially most of the time. Uh, used in transport capacity service, as I've said, so we basically represent each, like we have shifts of vans, you know, uh, performing deliveries. Every shift is represented as a uh, single actor, single sharded entity. That's because like, all the capacity is reserved for, like all the capacity available for a shift is reserved for that shift. We have 10 vans in this shift, we can deliver like 100 orders, right? As opposed to what we have in capacity where we have people and they can pick for different things and all that stuff is shared. So one yes. right operation uh, to the backup assistance yep. uh, is deemed successful only when the data is written to a center? Um, I think there is a concept of write concerns similar to Mongo. So you can you, you have control. I'm not 100% sure, like because we didn't need to tweak it. Like default settings were quite okay for us. So we just look at it, marked yes, default settings okay, move along. So I'm not so sure if you have like, yeah, well actually yes, sorry. Um, there is a concept of replication factor in Cassandra. Right, so it says that in order to, for a write to be successful, it needs to be acknowledged by this number of nodes. Well, well, sorry, I'm not so much on that. Mm -hmm. Just like it's that yeah. uh, what, what if you write something to mm -hmm. the actor state, yes. and before it gets uh, into Cassandra, mm -hmm. if uh, there's some error, yeah. would you return back to say the write is OK? That means the write to Cassandra is asking or saying. OK, um, so I think there are two concerns. Like, uh, first, what if Cassandra fails? What if write to Cassandra fails, right? So ACA persistence requires you to structure, well, strongly suggests you to structure your state updates in a way that they happen in a, call, in a callback to persist uh, method call, right? So it first persists, then it acknowledges that event was persisted in Cassandra. Then you apply your event. So classical uh, event sourcing approach, right? In that case, even if you fail to process this event, it's already in, in, in persistent storage. So when your actor recovers, it still reads the event and can apply uh, whatever it needed to. So the second one is what if, like what happens between Cassandra write and receive like when you initiated write to Cassandra and when you received response, right? So during that time, all the messages arriving to the uh, actor mailbox is what's it called? Stashed, I think. So it doesn't do anything, like at all. So you wait for the write to finish. Yes, there is a persist async call, which is said. You can use this if you really want to and you're really sure that nothing will break, we'll just persist and execute your you know, event change immediately, whatever, right? So then it's much faster, it can consume, but this is sort of risky. So classical event sourcing is that you first persist, wait for confirmation, then apply your state, state changes. Okay, does it answer your question? Okay, cool, thank you. Um, well, yeah, advantages, still strong consistency model, scales out like this. You just add the node, plug in, make, it, make sure that it connects to a cluster. Some part of the state is rebalanced, you know, migrated to a new node. Uh, all the nodes doing something useful, uh, no waste of resources. Uh, rebalancing crash network partition, well, disadvantages. Rebalancing crash network partition causes part of the application state to go down temporarily. And if you remember my uh, note about uh, not eager initialization of persistence plugin, when recovery, when, when the node crashed and some of the entities were rebalanced to a newly created node, right? Starting, uh, like, n because of not eager, in not eager enough initialization of persistence plugin, it was only initi initiated when the first message arrives. So the first actor takes a sort of a latency hit of four to five seconds. And because of that, because of our you know, uh, load balancer configuration and you know, latency guarantees, we were losing customer requests. We're responding 503, service unavailable, sorry. Uh, not a big deal, but we had to, do, fi had to fix this. 
Okay. Uh, this one is basically uh, like a final topic, so mm, yes. Do you uh, apply snapshots uh, to, or you just let them? Yeah, we do. Let's talk about that later. Um, so this is distributed data. So it's sort of a, another plugin on top of cluster. Right? So it provides you a collection of this conflict-free replicated data types, which is a, another you know, op concept of having a high-performance you know, data structure in memory that can be distributed, can be accessed by multiple readers and writers and resolve conflicts without, apply, without applying logs. Um, so features non-blocking masterless updates, so you don't have to designate a you know, particular node to perform all the writes and have like slave, master to slave replication and so on. Um, eventually consistent copying. Uh, control consistency levels, it basically has the, the write concerns and read concerns, similar to, I don't know, Mongo, Redis, whatever. oh, sorry, not Redis. Um, so if you write, if you write concern all and read concern all, then you're probably getting very consistent level. If you say write concern majority, read concern one, you're, you know, getting data very quickly, but risk, uh, you know, dirty reads, not updates, and so on. So consistency model, I'm not so sure about this. I just made it up, but it looks like, in our case, because we use read single, read local and write majority, it sounds like monotonic reads and monotonic writes, which basically means that if you read something to to to, to a node, like on the node one, you read you write something, your next read will return you this particular value. On other nodes, it might you know return you some like previous value or current value. It depends on. Uh, time constraints. Um, yeah, so in terms of availability, latency, blah, 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 our current setup favors availability and latency. Uh, using transport capacity, basically, uh, yes, can sure. Can you give an example of when you would need that multi master replication? So we're basically utilizing it in transport capacity to have a snapshot of all, all, all the internal actor states, right? Which is sort of a, a read-only one. So when we receive a read request, we immediately serve it from this local replica, right? Uh, Redis first is network code, second Redis runs in basically single-threaded mode, right? So there is just one, one instance. Here, we you know uh, ex explored a few options. We had we had Redis, we had uh, Hazelcast, we had Elasticsearch. Because we already had Akka sharding and so on, we decided to try distributed data. Uh, spoilers: not everything is that smoothly running. We had you know to to do a few iterations before we got it right. Uh, we had to remove a few things. That didn't work quite as expected, but so far it's working really well. But there's a possibility you're doing stale reads, right? What if your node hasn't gotten the Yes. So in our particular case, we want to be very consistent for writes. Showing inconsistent data for reads is OK. So we use this opportunity to you know, reduce our latency. So yes, um, very fast. Uh, queries if you read local, non-blocking updates from anywhere. You don't have to worry about what happens if two, two nodes update the same state. Um, not really suited to high cardinality data. So in docs, they say that 100,000 keys on the top level uh, data structure is probably too much. We actually observed problems with like 70K, but uh, high rate of requests. So you know, uh, we actually observe like server services were crashing because of out of memory issues because like entire memory was consumed by some mailbox in the distributed data thing because we're running like I don't know 20 to 25 requests a second and every request basically caused uh, part of the this distributed data thing to update 
And we spent like a few weeks trying to tune like various tunable parameters for the data. Eventually, we just removed part of it, and you know, de you know, reduced the state to like something like uh, probably one one point five key or something like this top level keys. Can you can you like, just give a summary of CRDP? What is CRDP? Uh, well, this is a very broad topic, but in general, it's sort of well, let, let me illustrate it by, by an example. So what if you want to count something, whatever it is, right? Um, there is a concept of positive and negative counter, which is one of the TRDTs. So it doesn't store you a single number, right? Because in order to ensure consistency, you need to lock on this, on this number so that different thread doesn't update it in the same time. So what PN counter does, it it stores how many times it was increased or decreased. In that case, different writers don't need to lock for, for a single resource, right? They just say, I'm increasing you. That's fine. Counter increases. So I'm decreasing you, counter decreases. So every r sort of write just appends, I don't know, an, an, a number somewhere. And then the value of the PN counter is just how many times I was increased, how many times I was decreased. Right? So this gives you a sort of a monotonic way of resolving conflicts between the different writers. There are more sophisticated, like this is one of the most basic ones. There are more sophisticated uh, CRDTs like uh, maps, lists, and so on. But they are you know, much, much more complex, so I wouldn't be able to cover it here today. <laughs> OK, um, yeah, I think that's it. So this is just for recap, uh, a copy of the very first slide. We have HTTP everywhere, streams for sort of integration and you know, really streaming data. Um, singleton to manage one gigantic, not, share, not shardable state in FC capacity and uh, ACA well, uh, cluster sharding to represent shardable uh, entity state in transport. OK, so a few references. Mostly ACA docs. I'm really like consistency models. This is really great. Uh, so these guys are, I think they're doing investigation into uh, how consistent your consi consistent store are. Like, they have a claim that Mongo is really not consistent at all. Like, you should not ever use it at all. It just loses writes, reads, and, and so on. Um, yeah, and I think that's it. Questions? It's a quite a complex system. Like, uh, having all the experience now we, after you build it, mm -hmm. what do you build it, like, the same way next time? I would build capacity service as a monolith. <laughs> That's it. No scaling. Uh, well, probably I need to rephrase this. I would probably build it as a sharding. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about like monolith from from perspective of multiple microservices. Mm -hmm. So even though they seem to be a little bit different because of this, you know, state difference in how. You mean you would have monolithic state? S probably, yeah. But that monolithic state would probably be sharded in one single system. So basically, using mul microservice architecture just added complexity of you know, managing all the remote calls, what happens if it fails, what happens if that fails, and so on. Uh, so microservices are interdependent? Well, there are a tree of dependencies, let's say. There are no two-way dependencies. So capacity service depends on fulfillment, FC, transport, a few other ones. Transport depends on one other service that's not shown here. FC doesn't depend on anything. It just reads from uh, a Google spreadsheet. Uh, works really well, actually. Uh, very convenient to operations. Um, what else? Yeah, so that's sort of not a, not a, not a graph of dependencies it, it's a tree well tree is a graph like a, but a but a subset of graphs unidirectional graph. yes unidirectional graph
This question was mostly about technology. So you use uh, like a streams persistence uh, symbol. So if you need to uh, re-implement the system like in uh, another company, mm -hmm. uh, but a similar request, you would suggest like same technology. So you think it's a, like best way to take it. I'm quite happy with what we have right now. Uh, that's probably not the best way, but I don't know. Oh, what would you what say if you think it's if you say it's not the best way? Um, so streams in capacity service, my opinion is that we overdone it a little bit. So I just recently, you know, reduced the amount of streams in there. So we're basically everything was a, either a flow or a stream or something. We just had like a few future-based APIs. But in, in this case, future-based APIs turned out to be much more simpler. And because we needed to do some pretty non-standard flow control, which was really easy in future <coughs> and not that easy in, in streams, the amount of boilerplate code was quite high and complexity was quite high. So this is what I'm doing. Like For Akka HTTP, this is as good as other frameworks. The concern here is that in, in Redmart, you know, most of the stuff is tailored towards play because most of the services are written in play and blah, blah, blah. So monitoring, logging, deployment uh, is tailored to play. So we need to, you know, tweak and adjust so that our services can utilize all the infrastructure help. Um, everything else, persistence, there are few quirks, but otherwise, well, it's event sourcing with all the advantages and disadvantages. I think it's applicable, very applicable in this case. Singleton? No. What would be instead? Uh, so, turn, well, that's hard to tell, right? I know that. Uh, so, but would it give you enough trouble that you would look elsewhere? Like? Yes, we basically, you know, having periodically we have a problem with them. So, for one latest one is that. It was failing rights to Cassandra, mm -hmm. and because of that, I'm not sure if it's by design or quirk or a bug, but if if right to Cassandra fails in persistent actor, it is stopped, bypassing all the supervision. And in case of Singleton, it doesn't restart when it receives a message, and it turned uh, in basically just one failure crashed entire. Well, it it didn't even crash; it just stopped the service. All the nodes are running. No rebalancing happens. Server service cannot serve requests until restarted manually. Uh, sharding, I think I would use it. So it's a uh, you know very you know it, it has some complexity in it as associated with it, but I think the benefit it provides is worth it. Mm -hmm. D data carefully, mm -hmm. you know, replica of entire state so that you avoid you know sort of broadcasting to all the actors gathering responses. Very useful way. But you know, returning to my uh, remark when we removed most of the state from D data, uh, we actually kept a list of uh, whatever it is. And it, this list was updated on every reservation cancellation. So when we removed that part and switched to scatter gather approach, performance improved like probably at least five to ten times. So need to be careful with that. So basically packet persistence and sharding can be recommended. The rest only if you if you are sure limited recommended. Yeah. With with boundaries. Singleton need to be very sure why you're using it. What do you mean by scatter gather approach? Uh, you just basically broadcast to everything and just wait for responses. So scatter is broadcast, gather is get responses, join them together, respond to the caller. But how is that an alternative to replication? It's not an alternative. So in this particular case, what we tried to do with D data is to have a list of, like, if I, if I want to cancel my reservation, I need to know where it is like in which particular actor it is remaining, right? So what we were doing, we kept a map of reservation IDs to whatever like actor refs, whatever allows us to identify the actor. Uh, at, at that time, it was crashing because of out of memory with something like 15 to 30 requests a second. When we removed that, you know, D data, you know, keeping all the uh, book of reservations. 
we now can sustain like 150 and cancellations still take reasonable time. So it was sort of a, an attempt to optimize so that we just, for reservation, uh, for cancellation, we look at the data and then we send one message to one actor. Now we are, don't do anything, just send to everyone, someone responds, fine. No one responds, we didn't have that. Still works well. Uh, state affinity. Data affinity. Ah, data affinity. It's basically, what was the, your first approach? It sounds like you did a manual data affinity kind of setup for some products like Hazelcast, Crane 2, and Ignite Dev is called data affinity. So, mm -hmm. uh, general job will reach the node where the data is actually located. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, well, so not exactly, I think. So we didn't cap kept where that data is. We kept a reference to a particular actor, which might be somewhere in the cluster. We don't know where. We just need a local uh, logical handle to that actor to send the message to. So with this optimization, what we try to achieve is that on every node we have a replica of sort of addresses where to send these cancellations to, like a, I don't know a, a phone book to some extent, right? So because of the cardinality of the data, like we could have hundreds, well, up to, up to 10,000, up to, well, actually up to 1,700 uh, records, right? Something was, you know, become broken in the data. So it wasn't about keeping affinity of the data. We just wanted to replicate it everywhere and just replace scattering, uh, you know, broadcasting to all the actors with just looking at the one single record in distributed data and sending one message. That's it. So Hazelcast, we could have used that. So, well, practically fulfillment pipeline service uses Hazelcast, right? But that's sort of a different, uh, I don't know, met metaphor. It's, it's just used as cache as a service, right? Which is, that's deployed to other services. Um, why haven't we because we had distributed data, so we decided to give it a try. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Uh, how do you look to Kafka? Would you think about putting it in your stack or something? Kafka? Yeah, Apache Kafka. Yeah, so we're looking into it. Uh, in Practically, we don't have it right now because infrastructure, like our DevOps team, was not ready to support that. We're gradually moving there. So there are a few integration places where we can start. One obvious one is to stream state changes from transport capacity to Redshift, right? Alternative would be to use Amazon Kinesis and Firehose, but there are you know, considerations of vendor specific solutions. Even the Redshift is already a vendor specific solution, but anyway. Um, yeah, so we're you know looking into adding Kafka somewhere somewhere in, in in the picture, not sure where, except for this one in particular. Maybe actually reservations cancellations. Yes, sure on the back. Louder. Yeah, I have two part question here. Sure. I'm not familiar with the clustering or the processing side of it. So I'm just, I'm just curious about uh, what is your uh, partial key. Uh, so. And how does it get guaranteed that uh, one message, which is actually submitted by a user mm -hmm. uh, later, uh, actually goes in the goes in the front? That's one. Thing. Okay. And the, the second part of the question is that I see that the gossip protocol is being uh, used for mm -hmm. communication. Yes. Now, gossip protocol is eventually consistent. So, yes. Uh, so what it means is that the one of the node actually uh, the leader gets a uh, gets a message and if it goes down, mm -hmm. and then the message is lost. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me try to answer the first part. The first part was, uh, yeah, partition key, right. So, like operations in, like we use sharding and partitioning, which is basically partitioning in transport capacity. Redmart model of operation in transport is that we have shifts that perform deliveries. Each shift have allocated a certain number of vehicles. Right, so all the capacity for that shift is reserved for that shift. And we basically use that shift, uh, whatever, handle name as a partition key. So the goal here is not to 
I, I sort of I foresee your next question. The goal here is not to ach achieve uniform distribution, because we know that you know shifts that relate to tomorrow and day after are more busy than you know the ones in the future. Our goal is to have sort of an, an entity that we can serialize access to, right? On the other hand, uh, shift name is just a string, basically. So consistent, uh, consistent caching on strings should probably give us reasonable distribution across the nodes. OK, um, second one about gossip protocol, right? So this one is used for for the part of our system that can tolerate eventual consistency. And that's it. So here we do actually we actually do have some eventual consistency in the system. We can afford it because it's basically used to speed up reads. We are not concerned about sort of showing slightly outdated view of the grid to customer. We're just concerned about not allowing the customer to place an order if it's you know outdated. Okay, does it answer the question? Sorry, and, and the gossip leader is the one which is. Uh, I think. Uh, I think gossip leader. Yes. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we have a sort of safety mechanism. So basically what we have in, in, in distributed data, right, is a replication of internal state of all the actors. So if the node goes down, all the actors are restarted on, on a different node. And last thing they do after being recovered is to populate their internal state. So it's not automatic. It required a little bit of manual work, not much, because it's like you know we just you know send a snapshot of the state to some service, and that service just propagates it to uh, distributed data. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? Sure. Yeah, just now, on the binding is mentioned. Uh, so it's a lot more. So, uh -huh. uh, I'm not sure where the answer uh, or the, the issue that you mentioned just now is uh, with regard to LeBron or the current implementation. Okay. But just the, the uh, given that you're using event sourcing yes. and do sharding and, yes. and you use active assistance, so mm -hmm. it seems like uh, Lagon is a nice fit. So have you considered? <laughs> Uh, we did consider Lagom. Uh, what stopped us is that Lightband actually have a paid product that runs it, which basically means that it's not that trivial to get it to run. We actually like we have uh, in our team in, in other team we have a guy who actually did Lagom and implemented a service in production with Logom, except he tear away everything except persistence and HTTP. And he had some, he had to do some, he had some learning curve, had to ask on forums and so on. So Logom is probably, you know, very sophisticated, very, you know, performant, uh, you know, a Bentley probably, right? Uh, but we cannot, I don't think we can afford, you know, just ramp, ramping up on that learning curve. Welcome. OK, let's wrap up. So thank you guys for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I have thank you slides.